Hey guys, I'm coming through to let you know that the IMG Roadmap course is coming back. Yes, that's right. We start on July 12th at 8.30 p.m. In order to sign up, click the link in the show notes to learn more. It's going to be a four-week course, online group coaching with me. You get both the self-paced format of the course and live support with me each Sunday for a total of four weeks. Come on over. Let's get you ready. The IMG Roadmap is the only podcast dedicated to coaching international medical graduates and success blueprints for this unique pathway. I am Dr. Nina Loom, your host, a previous IMG turned hospital medicine physician, healthcare administrator, speaker, and coach. I empower, encourage, and equip you with actionable steps that you can take towards the residency position of your dreams. Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of the IMG Roadmap Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Hazni Sakina. She is an ENT resident, so that's otolaryngology, and she's here to share her pearls with us. Welcome on the podcast, Dr. Hazni. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure to have you here. So we'll just get straight on into it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe tell us about what makes you an IMG, what your country of citizenship, where you went to medical school and those types of detail. Yeah, for sure. So I'm actually a US citizen born and raised. I went to a Caribbean medical school. That's why I'm considered an IMG. My path was a little different. It was my decision to go to the Caribbean was kind of based on the fact that I was doing something else in undergrad. And then I decided I wanted to do medicine literally April of my last semester of senior year. So my options were either to take a year off and take the MCAT or go to the Caribbean, which a lot of my friends had been to the Caribbean. So I was kind of aware of the process of you know, how it goes and kind of what to expect. So I decided to take that route so I wouldn't have to take a break. And now I'm a second year, well, finishing up second year of my ENT residency. That is so awesome. That is absolutely phenomenal. So where did you go to medical school? What was the name of your medical school? So I went to St. James on Anguilla. Okay. What year did you graduate? From St. James 2017. Awesome. And what year did you match into residency? Sorry, I graduated in 2018, my, and I also matched 2018 as well. Okay, I'm, yeah, Awesome. So you matched into ENT, which is a specialty that not a lot of IMGs even look into applying into. It is competitive in the sense that there are very few programs compared to maybe when you stand against IM, PEDS, or family medicine, there are fewer ENT programs. So can you walk us through maybe your match journey? Yeah, for sure. So. I guess my match journey is also a little a little different. Being an IMG, obviously, I think we're very discouraged to look at surgery overall, let alone like a surgical specialty. So I pretty much, when it came to applying, I actually called almost every single ENT program before applications even opened. So early on in the summer, just to see if they would even consider an IMG. And I made this huge spreadsheet of what their responses were. And I kind of like analyzed everything in terms of where I should be applying and who's even going to consider me. And I made my application very focused on each individual program. So I wrote a whole bunch of different personal statements that I felt like would fit better for certain places. And I kind of navigated it that way. I did also apply to internal medicine as a backup because, I mean, I think as an IMG, it is always a safer bet that if you are going to apply to a more competitive specialty that you should have a backup just in case you don't want to be in that situation where, you know, you're you know, come match day or come the day after soaps and you're just, you don't have a spot. Unless obviously that one specialty is exactly and the only thing you want to do. So then it's different. You know, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Particularly, let me just point this out. I agree with your strategy that you used. You did your research, you did your homework and everybody listening to take some notes here. What you did was you found out what you wanted and then you put in some extra time looking at programs individually and singling out the ones that you met criteria for. And then you targeted your application to them, whether that would mean 
you know, making sure that you had experiences that were required or writing personal statements that were directed towards that particular program. I think that's a big, big point because so many IMGs don't even put in the legwork to research programs. And they're hoping that they'll just maybe buy a list or use someone else's Excel spreadsheet and just like hit the jackpot that way when you could be a lot more specific and strategize to get in. I mean, would you agree with that? No, I completely agree with that. And that's the issue, right? I just feel like I know it's a stressful process, but if you really want a spot in in a place that's going to fit you, you have to put in that work. You really do. And it's not that, I mean, honestly, it, it just takes some time, but it's not difficult. The Frida system is available and free for us to look up all of the programs. So that way you kind of have their contact information and then it's just up to you to take that next step and reach out to them. And they're always receptive though. You know, program coordinators are more than willing to answer these basic questions about what they're looking for. Cause we have to also remember, I mean, I think the other issue, the other hand to this is that as an IMG, I don't think that our schools offer much guidance and direction in how to put in that legwork. So maybe that's the big gap in communication, you could say, in terms of how IMGs apply and what their match process looks like. But program directors here in the US, they're more than willing to take your phone call, answer your email, and kind of give you an answer in terms of what that program is specifically looking for. And you know, we have to remember that it is the program coordinators, not the attendings, not the program director. It's the coordinators that are getting the applications first and looking at them. So what does that mean? Can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Because that's something that most of us IMGs listening may not really realize the difference between like the coordinator's role and the program director's role. They may be thinking, oh my God, there's just one player, program director. But can you go a little bit into that? What was yeah. the realization? So I think my biggest realization is that each, each and especially now being on the other side, each department program has a specific rule in and rule out list. Once the ERAS system opens and, you know, applications start being sent, I think the way that it kind of works is it hits the program coordinator who is not a physician. It's pretty much um, just the person running the residency program that's assisting the program director who's the physician. So it hits the program coordinator's desk first. And he or she looks through those applications and it won't be all of them. It'll be like, let's say the first, hundred out of 500 that have applied. So they'll look through the first hundred and they will, using the criteria that's been given to them by the, you know, the committee or the program director, they'll rule in the applications or rule out the applications. And of those hundred, 10 of them will probably make it to the program director's desk. And that's for the first go. And then they'll, they will eventually get through all of the applications, but it happens that way that it's the coordinator's desk who's your application's hitting first. So, and, and again, I think reaching out kind of gives you an upper hand as well because you're putting your name into that program coordinator's head as well. Right, absolutely. I agree with reaching out as a method of sort of getting your name in there because there's something to be said about communicating with someone and building some type of online perception of a relationship with them because maybe you've been exposed to them before. So let me just backpedal. I just want to go back on some particular questions I want to talk about because I think you're going to be probably the first person I've had on the podcast that is in ENT that is an IMG. So, you know, there may be some other IMGs that are listening and thinking about, oh my gosh, I've always admired that specialty bit, but like it was outside of my reach. So Mm -hmm. can you talk to us a little bit about your performance on USMLE If you feel comfortable sharing as much or as little even scores, a lot of people want to know how they stand or where they stand based on the scores of other successful applicants in the past. So just walk us through your USMLE journey, step one, all the way to CSCK. For sure. So I took a good amount of time to study for step one. If you count it as a total, it's probably about three months. I think the biggest lesson that I came out of step one learning is that you just need to know how to answer the questions. There is way too much information in medicine overall for us to be able to ever feel comfortable that we're going to be able to pass this test with flying colors. Obviously, I think the future looks a little bit different with the pass fail rate instead of it being like a three digit score. But I think as far as the current situation and what it was in the past, the biggest thing 
to kind of defeat that anxiety that I think, especially IMGs, we, since we, we don't, for the most part, most IMGs don't have um, like a specific due date that they have to take step one by, right? And I think that's where a lot of IMGs kind of get lost because they don't give themselves a deadline. And I think, so that's the most important part. You've got to give yourself a deadline and you have to understand that you're never going to like be able to know everything in medicine. And even as a resident or an attending, you won't. Medicine is a practice. And it's that realization, the sooner that you get that realization, the more confident you're going to feel in your exam. The other thing that I learned is it's also about buzzwords. So most questions usually have a specific word in them that kind of navigates you to like answer the question, get the answer right. So if you kind of adapt to that way of learning, you're probably going to be a little bit better off instead of trying to analyze the entirety of the question. And the more questions that you do, the better you'll be at grasping that concept. So that was for step one. In terms of my scores, I don't really personally feel as comfortable sharing the exact number, but I will say that it was not like top notch. It wasn't like mediocre either, but it wasn't top notch. But that significantly improved for me in step two, more so because I guess I had my learning technique down at that point. So I think step two, I I had a 30 point increase in step two. So I definitely think that that helped me tremendously, I guess, in terms of matching into ENT. I do think though, now being on the other side of things and I've talked to my you know, attendings or just people in general, and I really think that while scores are important, I think it's about your entire application and showing that you are a wholesome person, that you have things and interests outside of just studying medicine. I think whether it's ENT, whether it's family med, whether it's orthopedics, it doesn't matter. I think every program is looking for a well-rounded person. And the more that you portray that in your application, the more likely they are to choose you for an interview. Right. I like all those points that you put out. So just asking, because maybe now you have more perspective for ENT, what are some key points that you think the application must carry? to make someone competitive for it. So that could be, what are the parts of the ERAS application that you think make the most difference for a person interested in ENT? I mean, you can talk about the kinds of rotations that they should be looking for, the types of scores that they should be targeting, the experiences that they should be targeting during their clinical rotations. Can you touch a little bit on that? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of ENT specifically, I think I will say scores are important only because, not because they portray what type of resident you're going to be, but mainly because they are part of the rule in, rule out criteria that our programs do have, just because it is a competitive specialty. So scores are important. I would definitely say most programs are looking for at least a 230 and above, at least. So if you're around that range, you should be fine. So that's the first thing. In terms of rotations, uh, it is definitely important that if you're, no matter what specialty you're looking at, if you are looking at a specialty, you should have done at least one to two rotations in that. And I know it's a lot more difficult as an IMG to get those rotations for us just because, you know, we have like the basic ones that our schools provide and they're usually not as prestigious of places as our counterparts in American medical schools are probably attending, but you make the most of what you can get. Or um, there are actually ways that you can set up your own rotation. And that's one of the things that I did is I worked with my school, worked with people that I knew, or you know, I made trips to hospitals just to go meet the program directors. And this is while I was in med school before applications, just, just trying to get rotations. So I would go and meet with physicians and see if there was anything that if they'd be interested in having me as a med student and if there was anything I can do to make that happen, then I would talk to their GME offices and work with my school and get those rotations set up independently of what my school was offering. And I think that was one of the biggest factors also that showed that I was extremely passionate and dedicated towards this specific specialty. And that reflects, right? When you work that hard to get that rotation and you rotate and you do well, when I say doing well, I mean like, 
when you are rotating, every person in that department should know your name because you should be saying good morning to everyone. You should be seeing how you can be helpful. Like you should not be a passive student by any means when it comes to rotations that you are in which fields you are actually interested in. Actually, you shouldn't be a passive student overall in any rotation because it's fairly obvious. And it's, it is actually surprising how many physicians know each other, regardless of the specialties or whatever that may be. Physicians all somehow know each other or hear of each other or like, and you may come up as a topic. So if you were a passive student in any one of those rotations, it may come up somehow one way or another. And you don't want that to be the case. You want to be sure that you are that student that, again, says good morning to everyone, says hi to everyone, right? You want to be that cheerful person. You want to put in the work and effort, like, Getting your patient's vitals and making the list, I think that's severely important for any surgical specialty. So when you're rotating with surgical specialties, I think that's like the biggest thing that'll like, you know, get you noticed. But it is also very beneficial if you ask to take on patients yourself. So patients who you would pre-round on in the morning, and then you'd be the one to present during rounds. And there'd be your responsibility. Obviously, you can't put in orders or things like that, but that would be your patient that you would work up, that you would have recommendations for, that you would present to the attending and then ha- take the attending's feedback. I think that kind of stuff is very important during rotations. So all of that reflects on the letter of recommendations that you get. And again, just word of mouth. It's surprising how much word of mouth can make a difference. I agree with everything you said, because actually when I do one of my online courses, I have a module on there where I talk about how to ace your clinical rotations. And those are the points that you've mentioned is showing interest, opting in for work and not waiting to get picked. Okay. I think a lot of IMGs get left behind because you're waiting for someone else to grant the opportunity when you should be creating the opportunity for yourself. And I really like that you mentioned reaching out to programs, securing your own rotations, getting your school on board with you to secure those rotations. Because I think one of the things that is really, from when I listen to your story, what I'm really gathering is you did not sit around and wait for opportunity to come to you. You forged ahead and you created it for yourself. So you were, you took initiative from the clinical rotations, from creating that deadline that you mentioned, which is one thing because a lot of, I just end up creating a gap of a year, two years in their application mm-hmm. just because they're studying for step one, because they have not set targets that they're going to keep up with. And I think all these points are so essential. If anyone's listening to us right now, I really want you to take some notes about securing your own rotations, getting your school on board with your plan and not waiting for them to create a plan for you and get you on board with it. Once you get in the front door and you're rotating at this hospitals, I want you to be forward about what you want. So you're going to seek opportunity. You're going to opt in for work. And then you use that as a way to network so that, attendings, program directors, the chair of the department, know who you are. That way, when you turn around and come back asking for a letter, just like Dr. Hazzy said, doctors know one another. When you get a letter from program director A or the chair of department A, they may be well known in their circle by the other program in another state that you're applying into. And those things do go a long way. Okay. So before I go off tangent, because I was I'm really <laughs> passionate about that, if you can tell, but you know, let's yeah. just get, let's get into some more, you know, cause some people are listening to this and they're thinking, well, Dr. Lou, you brought another IMG who just had a perfect story. She had a perfect pathway. I can't relate. Can you touch on maybe some challenges that you experienced? Did you have any kind of unusual things on your application, a gap year, anything that you felt like that was a big challenge to get through. And I'm standing on the other side telling you that you can do it too. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, like I didn't get a a yes from every place that I went to trying to secure a rotation. Most of those places were no. You have to find your loopholes, but, and that's the thing, right? You can't get discouraged about So I think I probably, even if I go back towards, so if I talk about just the places that I went to, to secure rotation, probably around 20 for throughout my third and fourth year, how many places actually said yes, maybe five and five of those I was able to secure. Aside that, when I'm talking about even making those phone calls and seeing what, you know, like programs I would meet criteria for, 
honestly, there, I've had multiple places just be like, no, we're not going to consider an IMG. So all of that is hard to hear. I had mentors that I looked up to and family friends and other physicians that I had just talked to before I was applying to get some guidance. And most of them told me, take two years off, you know, like do some research. I didn't have that much research as a background and ENT does like ENT programs look for research for sure. I didn't have that. So they told me to take two years off, take a year off, do some research and then reapply. But I just, I didn't want to stop. And I just thought that if I did that, I didn't want to fall into that circle where I don't have a deadline towards something. And, you know, I'm just kind of stuck in that limbo phase. And then if you even backtrack further, like when I actually decided to go to med school, I didn't have my MCAT. So, I mean, that's a question that does come up is, oh, you didn't take your MCAT. And I would say, no, I didn't. But that was, and again, you just need to be able to justify your actions. I think as long as you yourself feel confident as to why certain things happened and you're still like you were still able to overcome them and you're able to justify that, that's not a weakness that you need to look at. And programs won't see it that way either. Right, right. I agree with that. Being able to justify your actions goes a long way, especially when you come to the interview phase of things. But you should be able to justify those actions prior to interview because people have to be able to read and know who you are from your application as well. Definitely. Yeah. So you mentioned something. You said that when you applied, you targeted programs. Can you give us some tips how to target programs? For applications themselves? Yes, for applications. Like you said, you tailored them to each program. Yes. So you, yeah. Talk a little bit. So, about And I think what that kind of goes back to is you have to really talk to the coordinator and it might seem like you're pestering them and that's okay. That's, you know, that they're aware that students are going to do this during, <laughs> during, you know, the months of June through probably November until, you know, applications before they open and until they close, students are going to do that and they're okay and they're prepared for it. So don't hesitate to pester them. You need to get exactly what those programs are looking for. And the best way to do that is by communicating with the coordinators. So I looked at one, I made a list of the programs that straight up told me, no, we're not going to consider an IMG. And I did not apply to those. I think that, you know, applications are expensive and if you already have a straight answer that your application is not going to make it on the desk, then you should save your money at that spot. Otherwise, I reviewed... Um, so I, sp- I would ask about like research. I would ask about specific letters that they're looking for. Then I would go on their website and kind of study that as well and see what is their website, fo- website focusing on. Is it showing you know, like the love of the area because programs do want to know that, especially if you're going to be there for five years, they want to know that you're going to be someone that's going to go there and be able to adjust and not get homesick or be somebody who's just kind of boxed into their own apartment and kind of miserable being there. So I think it's important to show in your application that not only are you passionate about the specific specialty, that you're passionate about their program or their city or that you'd be more than happy to be there and be a part of their family that you're joining. Because that's what it is. You're joining a family. You're going to spend more time with these people for the next three years, five years, however long your program is, than you will with your parents, your family, your kids. You're going to spend more time with those individuals. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 100% with everything you've shared with us. I really appreciate you coming on, making some time off your busy residency schedule to share Everything that you've told us today, I know it'd go a long way to help other IMGs that are listening. We're rounding up here and I just want to touch on one more thing. Can you tell us how you got your research opportunity that, you know, the research that you ended up including in your final packet as an IMG, how did you create that? So I had two opportunities actually. So one was through the, one of the last rotations that I did. I was able to secure some research with a couple of the residents that are working there. And again, it's about showing interest. If they know that you are interested because you have asked, then they will literally lay down the table for you with a whole bunch of different options and it'll be your pickings, you know, but residents need to know that you're interested in doing the work and then things will come your way. The other opportunity that I have for research is our, uh, well, my school requires that we have a 
a lit review or some sort of some sort of research before we graduate. So I had been working on that all fourth the year. So I was able to get that finished in time for my applications. But other ways, honestly, is every place that you go, regardless of whether it's in your specialty or not, if you know that the specialty you're looking at requires research, it does, they're not looking at like, like for example, ENT programs don't specifically think that you need to have ENT specific research. You can have research in GI, you can have research in hematology. They're not going to count that against you. That'll actually be counted for you because that's still showing interest throughout your medical school career of you being a dedicated student, of you being involved. So securing research is really not difficult. I just don't think that as an IMG, we are instructed on how to do it. So again, it's about going out and just kind of creating that for yourself. Right. Thanks so much, Dr. Hasney. That was perfect. Perfect, perfect, Thank perfect you. information. Before we let you go, what is your mantra for success? What are some things that you live by? And any last advice or tips for, you know, people that are M1, M2 on the island right now? I've actually been to St. James. I've visited the school. So I can imagine, you know, seeing the students there. And they're like, man, you know, wow, I want to be where she's at. What do you have to tell them? Don't let anyone tell you no. I feel like as an IMG, you're going to hear no a lot and it's discouraging. And if you listen to it, then you're not going to end up in a place that you want to be at or or where you're going to be happy at. So don't let anyone tell you no. When they tell you no, just work five times as hard to get that yes for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't let anyone tell you no. Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.